All right. Good morning, everybody. We'll talk a little bit about vermicomposting today. I've got some live people here and everybody out on the computer too. If you have any questions, just feel free to text those in the comments. And Connie's running the camera for us today and she will uh, read them off to me as they come in. Uh, we're gonna do two things today, guys. Uh, we're gonna talk about vermicomposting and then when we get done with this talk, if you guys wanna stay a little bit longer or the ones online wanna stay on, we're actually gonna build a worm bin probably takes about 15 minutes, but I want to show everybody how to make their own worm bin fairly cheap compared to buying one offline. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that after we get through the presentation here, guys. So what is vermicomposting? It's basically the act of using microorganisms and compost worms to break down food waste. Now here's the funny thing about composting worms. Everybody thinks the worms are eating the garbage, but they're actually not. The worms are actually eating the bacteria and microorganisms that are already on the food that's trying to break it down naturally. Has a consequence of the worm eating the bacteria off the food, the worm actually eats some of our food and gets it into its digestive system. So as it passes out its digestive system, that's how we get worm castings, which are highly nutrient and rich. Uh, I've used a lot of different compost over the years and worm castings by far are my favorite to use. Uh, plants uh, respond to them very, very well. Probably after worm castings, your fish emulsions are probably your best fertilizers out there, but all compost is good. So we won't have to worry about saying, well, static pile of compost is bad. Got a little bit of background noise here. Let's let this guy pass. So reasons why we would want to vermicompost is uh, for us gardeners, for people who are plant people, we want to produce an all natural uh, compost that's free of chemicals, that's uh, our own waste. What I tell my wife all the time is, is when I go to the grocery store, I used to feel really bad about throwing food scraps away. I just was like, that's a waste. But now everything goes in my worm bin, so I feel like I'm getting 100% of my money from the grocery store because whatever we don't eat or whatever droppings or ends of things that you cut off, the worms eat and give you fertilizer. Um, you can also get healthier plants without the use of chemical fertilizers. So anybody who's into an organic uh, growing and especially on food crops, these worm castings are a great way to give natural organic uh, fertilizer back to your uh, plants. Increased disease resistance. I think most of us know that just like humans and animals, if you're healthy, you're gonna stave off diseases better. So by just putting down vermicomposting around your house plants and your garden plants gives them that much healthier, that keeps disease and insects at bay. Um, also avoid uh, plant waste from filling up the landfill. Everybody who lives in town knows that the city comes along and will take your plant waste. Now, some cities are real good about composting that, but I will tell you guys, uh, a lot of small towns say that they're composting that waste, but really it ends up going to landfill, okay? So I'm not gonna call nobody out, but I've seen it with my own eyes. The trucks pull up at the landfill that are composting trucks with all that plant debris, and you think, oh, that went to a composting facility. No, it goes to the landfill too. So that's one way to keep that stuff out. Big reason why I love to do composting with worms is how fast it is. One third the time that it takes to traditionally compost. So anybody who's ever composted in their yard before knows that it takes several months to have that compost broke down. Compost worms will do it in two or three weeks. So uh, really, really fast at it. And if you love the fish or you know anybody who fishes, they're gonna be your best friend because you're gonna have endless worms. No more paying three or four dollars or whatever they are a dozen for night crawlers now you'll have an endless supply of worms forever so uh, I know guys that actually grow worms to fish with not the compost with the compost is just something they have to put in there for them to feed they don't really care about the compost they want the worms um, types of composting worms guys Anisia photita that is the one that we use the most in composting. Uh, red wiggler is the common name for that. Uh, the Anisia photita is its, uh, its, its uh, genus name. Trout worms, banding worms, tiger worms, maybe you've heard these uh, terms thrown out before. Those are all red wigglers. They all have different common names depending on what part of the country you're in. Then you've got Anisia hortus. Uh, that would be your European night crawlers would, would fall into that category. That's our native ones that we have in West Virginia. And I know somebody's going to ask me this question. You cannot use local earthworms to compost with. Our local earthworms have evolved here to live in heavy clay soils and they like to break down forest matter. They like leaves and grass clippings and things like that. They also eat a lot slower than the red worms do. So they don't break down near as quick. 
And also, too, our native earthworm has a, a period of hibernation. When it gets cold in the winter, they go deeper into the soil, and that's kind of where they stay. So therefore, they wouldn't be composting for you. The red wigglers are a tropical worm. They can't go below freezing. We'll talk about that in a second, but they eat constantly, 24 hours a day, and don't stop. That's what makes them nice. Now, the Enderellus here, African night crawlers. I love these, guys. I really love African night crawlers, but I don't want anybody out there to take and use African night crawlers until you have used red wigglers and you're about two or three years experience growing red wigglers. Uh, African night crawlers are fantastic. They're as big as number two pencils. You can almost have a conversation with them. You can look them in the face, they're so big. With that, they eat compost a lot faster than the other worms do, but if they get below a certain temperature, they die. They're, they're a very warm worm, so uh, you really gotta keep your worm bin at a pretty stable uh, temperature, and that requires a little bit of skill. So don't start with the African night crawlers if you have not ever composted with worms before. Um, sex life of a worm, guys, is highly important, and you'll see here in a minute. Worms are hermaphrodites, so they can pretty much give birth with themselves. But what happens with most worms is, is we just are in April right now. The worm moon we had in April. Does anybody remember them talking about the worm moon? Okay, the full moon that we had at the beginning of April was the worm moon. The full moon we had last night was the pink moon. The reason why we call that moon the worm moon in the first of April, if you guys would have went out during that first week of April when the moon was high, and maybe you did go out at night and you'd seen it and you didn't realize what was going on, all of our earthworms are on top of the ground. There's thousands of them. They come out during that week, and that is their annual mating for our local uh, earthworms. So what they prefer to do is they mate one time with another worm in their life, and then they give babies the rest of that time. They like to take another worm's sperm instead of using theirs because they want to cut down on crossbreeding in their own population. But if that worm is solitary and it's by itself, it will go ahead and sex with itself to grow a population out. So worms can go back and forth. These red wigglers in your bin are going to be the same ways, guys. They're probably going to mate in the bin at least one time with another worm, and then they'll go through their cycle, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But just know that they are hermaphrodites. Now, the wide band. How many times have you guys pulled a worm out of the ground and you've seen this, this band around it? That's actually called the simtellum, is what that's called. That is its sexual organ. When you see a worm with the band on it, that means it's sexually mature at that point. And why is that important? You want to make sure that your worms are having sex in your worm bin so you're keeping your population going, okay? And when you see those worms with those symptoms, you know that your worms are having sex in the bin at that point because they're sexually mature. Now, most compost worms will lay two to three eggs a week through their sexual maturity. That lasts about six to eight months, their sexual maturity. Most worms live about eight to 12 months and then they die. So here's a picture of the cocoons that you guys are looking at. Uh, the ones that are online with me, you should have had this presentation emailed to you. If you didn't, just send us anything in the comment and I'll make sure that we get this to you at the end of the presentation. Now guys, these cocoons you would think in dark soil are gonna be hard to see. And they are at first, but once you learn what they look like, they just stick right out of that compost. And why that's important is if you're in your bin, and you're seeing cocoons, then you know that your worms are having sex and you've got all the life stages in your worm bin, so you've done a good job. Thumbs up to the worm parents. Um, also, if you guys are going to harvest your worm castings, and we'll talk about that at the end of this presentation, you wanna make sure that you know what those cocoons look like so you can pick them out of the material and put them back in the bin so you don't throw your babies away. Uh, these cocoons are reddish brown, so they're very easy to see. Most of that media in your compost bin is gonna be black. So that reddish brown is really going to pop out to you uh, after you get your eye trained on what one looks like. It takes on average of three weeks for the worms to hatch. So if you see that cocoon, depending on when it was laid, there's a three week period before they hatch. Each cocoon is going to yield about three live worms. There's probably five to six in each cocoon, but usually only half survive. And that's pretty common. Uh, most uh, compost worms will lay for a six month period, guys. So usually it takes them about three months to two months, depending on how well the habitat is of your bin for them to be hatched out and to turn into a mature worm to have sex. They usually mate for six months and then they usually spend the last three months of their life just eating and wiggling around in the bin and uh, they eventually will just pass away and actually the other compost worms will compost them. Now they're, they do not eat each other when they're alive, but if one dies, they will consume the body of the other one and you'll never see it in your, in your, uh, your compost. 
Now, this diagram here, I do apologize. There's a lot more parts of the worm on this diagram. This is one that you'd probably get if you was in college. Um, I always add this in the presentation because I think that maybe you guys might want to look and just see all the different parts. Really, the symptellum is, is the most important part, that sexual organ, which is right here that you see, and that kind of lets you know your worms are mature. But if you get further down and you want to know all the different parts of the worm, there you go. So at your own leisure, you can read over that diagram. Best environment for your worm bin. So what we're talking about here going throughout the rest of the presentation is red wiggler. So do not take this into account if you're growing African night crawlers. Like I said, I would prefer to see you guys start with red wigglers and work your way in to those uh, African night crawlers if you so degree, uh, want to. The ideal temperature range between 59 and 77. Now, can the worms work on either side of that temperature? Yes, they can, but they start to actually have some limitations. Uh, once we get uh, in around that temperature range, and we'll talk about that in just one second. Worms can also work around uh, uh, temperatures below 50 degrees. So if you go home and your worm bin's at 55, you're still okay. But if your area that you're storing your worms in starts to get below 50, your worms are gonna slow down. They're not going to eat. They're gonna probably amass into the middle of your bin where it's warm, and there's gonna be a big giant ball of worms, and they'll just kind of get in the ball to keep each other warm. Um, you start getting below 45, red wigglers die. They will die. So uh, they actually will just completely just stop and they don't really freeze to death because it's still above freezing, but they, they, just, they just die right on the spot within about three hours. So you wanna make sure that wherever you've got your worm bin, you don't have wide swings of temperature. A basement is a great place for a worm bin uh, because you know it stays a pretty constant temperature. A garage is another good place in the winter time but you gotta be careful about unheated garages in the summer because they get way too hot. And that's my next point that I wanted to let you guys know. Heat is a killer for worms more than the cold. They can withstand colder temperatures better than they can hotter temperatures. Obviously we know worms are slimy and slick, so it doesn't take very long for them to be exposed to high temperatures before they actually will just rupture and explode open. They'll just rupture open. They get hot, they just come blow open. Uh, and they, they stink. They, they have a terrible smell when they, when they get real hot like that. Um, so you want to make sure that you're, wherever you put them, you're definitely never going to get above 83 degrees. 80, 85 is the cap, but I always tell everybody 83, so that way you've got that wiggle room. Over 85, you're going to have some problems. Um, worms before a pH of 5 to 9, don't worry about that too much. I put that in there because there are some people that feed maybe a certain food stream to their worm bin more than other. Most of us at home are putting lots of different things. But let's say that you were canning and you've got a bunch of tomato skins left over from a canning operation and you throw it in your worm bin. That could be too acidic for your worms. It could drop the pH really quick. But a pH of five to nine, that's a wide range for a pH and those worms can work in it. So really anything that you guys put in your worm bin, it's still gonna probably be between five, five and six, five always. I've, I've tested it afterwards, did a pour through method and I've never had one higher than that or lower than five, five. The bins also need ventilation. We gotta have air in there, so keep everything going. Um, the best environment for your worm bin is it needs even moisture. Now this will be your hardest challenge as a new worm parent is the, the moisture in your worm bin, guys. And I'm gonna tell you, it is not difficult to keep the worms moist. That's not the problem. It's they get too wet in the worm bin because we're throwing a bunch of wet food material in there. So when you do that, you get a lot of secretions. Now, uh, the worms can take pretty wet soils and still like it. Um, one good indication that you've got something wrong with your bin is when you open the lid of your bin, if all the worms are up on the sides of your bin trying to crawl out, that needs to tell you, hey, something's not right because they're leaving the area because they're not happy. Most of the time, there's two reasons for that to happen, or three reasons, I'm sorry. One is they're hungry. So that's the first thing I would do is get my trowel out, dig down in and see if all your food's going. Because they're hungry, they're crawling out looking for something else. That's the number one reason why they crawl. Number two reason is the bin's too wet. If it's too wet, you can do several things to correct that problem. You can add some dry material, shredded paper, oats work good, cornmeal works good, the worms love that types of things. So you can go to Aldi or to save a lot, get a cheap thing of oats to feed your worms to kindly sop up some of that wet material if you put a lot of wet vegetables in there. And the other thing is, is if you have mites, you will have some mites, and I want everybody to know that. You will see some mites in your bin. They're just going to be there naturally, okay? Now, these mites don't come out of your bin. They're not going to infect your house, so you don't have to worry about that. They're going to stay in that bin. Those mites are actually helping eat food, too. So the mites are actually breaking down food. 
but in high populations, the mites can actually attack the uh, worms, and that's not what we want to see. So the way to fix that problem is, is diamaceous earth. And you can buy diamaceous earth at any feed store. You can order it online. And what I do, guys, is every week when I feed my worms, or every time I feed my worms, either once or twice a week, depending on the load, I will take my box of diamaceous earth, it's inexpensive to buy, and just lightly sprinkle diamaceous earth right on top of everything in the bin. Now, diamaceous earth is ground up seashells, basically what it is. And I tell everybody to an insect, it's just like if we would get in our underwear and crawl across broken glass. That's what it does to the insect. It does not hurt the earthworms because they're down inside the media and they're not going to eat that. But the mites have to come to the surface. They can't stay down in the media very long. They have to surface for air. They're going to come in contact with diamaceous earth. It's going to cut them and slice them, and they're just going to die. So that's the best way to control mites in your bin. But those are the three reasons why worms would come out of your bins is a high mite population, it's too wet, or they're out of food. Um, basement or garage, we've already talked about that, is the best locations. Can worms be kept outside? Absolutely with restrictions. This weekend at my house, I will take my worm bin outside for the season. It's warm enough now to where I'll bring it out. Now, if the weatherman calls for a night below 45, and we still may get a couple of those in the next two to three weeks, then I'll have to bring my worm bin back in. Um, I put my worm bin outside because I feel like it dries a little bit better in the summer when it's outside, but it stays in the shade all the time. Your worm bin should never have any sun on it any time. It should always be in the shade. So if you've got a covered porch back up against the house is a great place to set your worm bin. Just make sure the evening sun doesn't come in on the corners of the porch because it ain't going to take long for these bins to heat up when the sun hits them. So that's the big thing. Now, what do your worms eat? There's the next question. Now, they just can't eat everything that, that we throw away. You're still going to uh, have to throw some trash away or still compost traditionally in a pile outside. So worms like pretty much every vegetable scrap. I'm not going to go through what they really like because you guys can read for yourself. I want to talk more about what they dislike, okay, because there's some rules here. Now, if you're just starting out, you may stay with this chart and don't feed your worms anything. But, and that's why I put on here that a citrus and acidic fruit skin, you can't feed your worms. That's not necessarily true. But for a beginning course, I don't want people to go home and make a bunch of lemonade and throw 15 lemons in their worm bin. That's too much, that will kill them. The acidic of it, they don't like. But if you're a type of person who has Taco Tuesday once a week and you're using a lime or a lemon to season your taco meat with or your steak or your chicken, you can throw that lemon skin in there. One is not going to hurt. If you eat an orange a day, that's really not going to hurt. But if everybody in your family is eating an orange a day, that's too much. So you got to be careful with the citrus. Um, I occasionally will throw it in, but most of the time my citrus skins by default go into the regular compost pile. Spicy foods, onions, garlics, leeks, capsaicin, hot peppers is what we're talking about. Those are no-nos too. Now, you can put these in your worm bin. The mites will still eat these at a slower rate, but the worms will not. They will just work around this stuff. They'll take a taste off of it, like, nope, I don't like that, and they'll just eat everything else. So when you go back into your worm bin, there's a good chance you're gonna still see chunks of onion and garlic and things like that that weren't consumed, but the mites will slowly break it down. You leave it in there long enough, it will break down. So I'll leave that up to each individual but I would not can a bunch of hot peppers and throw all the seeds in that bin at one time if you've been doing several quarts of pints of peppers. That's too much of that. Meat and dairy products is a no-no. Never put any of those in there, hands down. Leave that stuff alone. Bread and pasta. Here again, guys, limitations. Um, I've played around with this. I actually put a half of a Spring Hill Bakery sheet cake in a worm bin one time just to see what would happen. And the worms ate it. They, they, they like birthday cake too. Uh, the worms did eat it, but they ate it a lot slower. It took them a little bit longer to work through, and we ended up getting a little bit of mold on top of the cake, so I really had to break it up and work it down into the, the media to cover it up. Um, so I wouldn't recommend it, but they did eat it. But if you've got the hill of your bread off a loaf, the hills can go in there. It ain't going to hurt nothing. Um, you know, a little bit of pasta is not going to hurt something. If, you, you know, if you've made spaghetti night and everybody's eating, you've got a little bit left in the pot, those noodles, that's not going to hurt, but you don't want to make it a regular habit. If you, if you like to eat pasta every day, that's too much. So once again, be careful with that. Shiny paper, guys. Shiny paper, the only place that I see this now would be magazines, and some of the circulars that are in the Sunday paper are still on that shiny paper. You know, you kindly hold it up and you can see the glare on it. 
can't use that. That shiny paper will, the worms won't, de, uh, uh, won't decompose that. Um, a lot of that paper has got those wax coatings and stuff on it, and there's also some heavy metals in some of those inks. Not all inks are soy-based still. So those are heavy metals that you're putting in there. So go ahead and, 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 and recycle those as you normally would. But anything that's collared paper that's not shiny, collared printer paper that's come out of a printer, the, the funnies out of the newspaper, any of those papers can go in your compost bin. If you don't have a shredder at your house and you're wanting to come into worms, I highly recommend that you buy you a shredder too. Because all that junk mail, shred that every day and you'll have a nice supply of shredded paper and you always want to mix shredded paper in your bin. That'll help sob up some of that moisture and also that gives them some bedding too. And they'll eat that paper. So you guys can use that. Fats and oils, that's grease, bacon grease, that types of things. Obviously, we don't want to put that in the bin either. So go ahead and dispose of that as normal. Um, I will say over here too, and, and I, I throw this out because we work with a lot of different people and, and, and a lot of people are doing different things today. And we've got some back to lander folks that, that live off grid that we, that we work with. Not a lot, but there's a few around. But I will tell you guys that you can use composting worms in an outhouse. Red worms work great in an outhouse setting. So if you've got a farm or a hunting camp and you've got a privy dug, you can introduce red worms into that hole and they will eat human waste. They'll eat toilet paper, they'll eat human waste, they'll eat animal waste. So hog, pig, it doesn't make a difference. These are manure worms, that's another name for them. They will consume that and turn that into clean, viable compost. Um, now, obviously, if you've got them in your privy, you might not be using that for compost, but the point is, is you're keeping your waste down inside that privy. You know, you may never ever have to dig a hole ever again. If you've got worms in there forever, they're gonna eat that waste, it's never gonna fill up. So that hole is always gonna stay empty. Also too, you won't have as much smell in your outhouse. So that's the other thing, because these worms are gonna compost that down. So I just always like to throw that out there because I know a lot of guys have hunting camps and some people are trying to live off the land again. So, um, how many worms will you need? So here's your homework. So you've taken my class today and you're thinking, man, I'm gonna go on the internet and I'm gonna order everything. No, stop. We gotta wait, we gotta figure out how many worms one needs. Everybody's family's different. You might live by yourself, you might have eight in your family. Are you vegetarians? Are you omnivores, do you eat half vegetables? Do you eat more meats? Those, all those things come into factor. So we always wanna do the two to one ratio. So I've got it put down for you guys, real simple math to follow here. But an example, one pound of worms for each half pound of waste generated weekly. So what I tell everybody to do, if you don't have a kitchen scale, which most people do, but if you don't invest in one, they're inexpensive, you can buy them off Amazon for like six bucks. And every day, put a bowl on that kitchen scale and I want you to weigh out the food that the worms can eat. Now obviously we've got a list back here of food that the worms can't eat, but every day, put food scraps in that bowl and, and weigh it and go ahead and do what you will with your food scraps. If you're throwing them in the trash, go ahead and put them in the trash. If you're composting them, then go ahead and compost them. Write down that number. At least do that for 14 days. Three weeks to me is a better representation because we're all busy. One week, you know, guys, we're, we're, we're eating out all week and in the next two weeks we're eating at home. We all live that lifestyle. So I tell everybody three weeks is a better representation and figure out how many pounds of food waste a week on average you and your family waste. And then you're gonna come back and you're gonna say, well, we have one pound of waste a week. Then that's gonna tell you that you need to order two pounds of worms. So you know exactly how many worms you need to order. So it's real easy uh, to do the math on that. You just gotta do that little bit of homework two to three weeks out and weigh your food scraps. Best place to get worms is from a friend who enjoys composting or mail order. And that's true. There's nothing wrong with getting worms from a friend, but I will tell you guys this. Depending on how well you are of a worm parent, the last thing I want to do is get worms from somebody whose worm bin's full of mites. So do yourself a favor and check that worm bin before you take worms. Now, you're going to get mites. They're going to come, but you don't want to go ahead and bring thousands in already on free worms, okay? They'll show up on their own later. Uh, they're just on, on stuff. The eggs are on food scraps that we put in and they hatch out and that's how they get in there. Um, also too, we want to make sure that if you are ordering through the mail, you want to pick certain times of the year, and this is coming from experience from me, okay? Just this spring, I ordered some new worms. I did it the week of the ice storm. So they were supposed to come two-day FedEx. They came a week later. Dead worms arrived, box number one. Company resent them to me. We were out of that freeze. 
the worms came box number two dead again because we had fluctuating temperatures. Now, the companies will tell you they'll ship worms year round and they will. But I'm here to tell you right now it's the best time to get your worms. April and May are perfect times to order them. October and November are the next best times to order them because they don't like to be cold or hot. You guys got to think they're on tractor trailers. They're sitting in distribution centers for even those 48 hours exposed to temperatures. And then they're on these trucks on the interstate, sun's baking down, it's not like they're air conditioned. So try not to order your worms in the hot part of the year or the super cold part is what I'm getting at. Order them in the mild part and you should have better success at getting them through. But every company that I've ever dealt with will reship worms. If they show up dead, they're gonna ship them to you and ship them to you until they show up alive. So most of the companies are real good about that. Breeder worms. Now, when you guys go to look at your worms, there's gonna be different classification of worms and different price points. Breeder worms are fully grown and sexually mature, hence why they're called breeder worms, okay? You're gonna pay the most for these per pound. And you're guaranteed that every worm you get is sexually mature. Now, I use bed run worms, and that's what I would tell you guys to get. Bed run worms are gonna be a little bit cheaper to buy, and they're gonna be worms of all different sizes. So the company didn't have somebody take the time to pull the adults out. So you're gonna get adults, you're gonna get juveniles, and you're gonna get cocoons. I like this better, because you've already got all three stages going on in your worm bin, and that way you keep your population going. Here's what I'm trying to explain. If you got the breeder worms, chances are it's going to take a week for those breeder worms to get acclimated to the bin then they're going to mate or they're going to start laying cocoons if they've already mated before they came to your house it's going to take another three weeks before you see baby worms so you've had a whole month that you get no new worms really if you get the bed run you're going to have adults juveniles that are maturing into adults in that same four week period that are having sex Plus, you've got cocoons that have hatched out, and you've got the next generation of worms ready to backfill your bin as the adults that you first got and the juveniles that you first got have came sexually mature. They're going to lay more eggs. I like the bed run a lot better, guys, because you, I feel like you're getting a lot better um, um, uh, sexual maturity in that bin. You're getting all three stages. Never dig worms out of your own yard. Once again, that goes back. Do not use our native earthworms. They won't work for us, guys. Now, <clears throat> types of worm bins. Now, here in a minute, I'm gonna build a worm bin for you guys. It's gonna take me a few minutes. But you can use wooden boxes, plastic bins, or commercial bins. The reason why I'm gonna build one today is, is there's lots of nice commercial bins online. They really are, and there's some fancy ones. Now, if you plan on keeping your worms in your kitchen, I think some people are like, what? Yes, lots of people keep their worm bin in their kitchen. They just open up the lid and scrape everything in there. These worm bins will not stink. If your worm bin smells like garbage, something is wrong. You've got a septic issue and the worms are probably dead or are crawling up the sides. Uh, it should smell like mushrooms. When you take the lid off your compost bin, it should smell like mushrooms. Now, if you've loaded the bin up with a lot of food and the next day you open it up, you may get a small whiff of, of rotten type food smell. But it's very light and it usually only lasts that one day, but it's not gonna permeate your whole kitchen. It's only when that lid comes off, you're just gonna get that, that waft, that first little waft that's built up underneath that lid. Um, I've had my worms on and off. I've kept them now for almost a decade. And yesterday I had an AC guy at my house and he literally has his arms on my worm bin guys with the vents. And I thought that he would probably ask me like, why does your tote got holes in it? He never said nothing. He didn't even know what was in there. He was talking to me for like 20 minutes with his arms on my worm bin and never knew that what he was leaving. Never smelled nothing, never said nothing, so it works really, really good. Um, three cubic feet of bin space can hold three to four pounds of food. So, not only by weighing out your food is it gonna tell you how many worms you get, but it's also gonna tell you what size worm bin you need to buy too for your family. So, use those numbers too to make sure you're getting the right size worm bin. You can use newspaper and core for bedding. Now, if you guys buy worms from an internet and you go ahead and buy bedding, and if you don't have any bedding material, by all means, order that bedding with it. They're going to send you a bag of shredded paper, and they're going to send you a block of coconut core. And for you guys who don't know what coconut core is, it's, it's ground up outside of coconuts. Us in the horticultural world, we've used core for years and years and years, but you put a brick in a bucket of water, you pour a gallon of water, and it expands like five times its size. So it comes in compressed. You mix the shredded paper with that, put that in your worm bin, dump your worms in, let them acclimate for about 48 hours, and then you can start adding food, your food scraps. That's how that works. 
every time you start a new worm bin or you harvest out your worm castings, you want to start with a brick of core and some shredded paper. Now going forward, as you add your food scraps, you want to keep shredded paper on top. And that, that will keep everything insulated and hold down any stinks or anything like that too. And I'll show you guys here in a minute how that works. So I've got a picture here for you guys standing here with me in person. I apologize, these were in black and white color printers are kind of hard to find around here. Uh, everybody at home, you should have this in color, but you're seeing the newspaper on top of a bin. And we've got the bin underneath us here. We're going to make one very similar to this today. But as you guys can see, when you come in with your food scraps, you would just take your hand and you would rake back this shredded paper, put in your new food scraps, and then just bury it back up with the newspaper or the shredded paper, and that's it. Just put the lid back on, go about your business. Very, very simple. The worms do the rest for you. So guys, here's the types of vermicomposting bins. Now, the very first one is buckets. Those are five gallon buckets. You can make a worm bin out of five gallon buckets. This is probably the cheapest way to make one. You could probably get off somewhere around in the $20 range using buckets, okay? But they're more work to deal with. They're not my favorite to use, but they do work. So I, I'm not gonna knock the system. Um, there are several designs online, so if you go on Google and type in vermicomposting worm or, or, or bucket bin, all these blueprints will pop up and different things. The next one in the middle is a commercial bin. I apologize again, guys, it's kind of dark to see. These commercial bins come in all different shapes and sizes. The cheapest one starts at $100 and they go from there all the way up to 300 bucks. There's nothing wrong with these commercial bins. They look nice. Uh, matter of fact, once again, if you're going them in your kitchen, you may want a commercial bin because it, it looks nice. It's not going to be just a tote or a wooden box. It's going to have collar to it. You can get them in different shapes and they'll kindly go with your decor. Now, if you're handy and you got a bunch of wood, which I think we all know at this point in the game that the wood worm bin probably costs more than the commercial plastic ones do at this point with the price of lumber. Worms work great in, in wood. You can make wood bins too. I've not seen any wood bins that are commercially available. I have looked, but there's plenty of blueprints online again to build your own wooden ones. Um, if you're going to plan on keeping your worms in one place, if I live further south where we didn't have to worry about cold winters and I could keep my worms outside all year, I probably would do the wooden bin and put it outside. But we got to come back and forth. I don't really think wooden bins are the greatest in West Virginia. I like things that I can move, buckets, the commercial bins, or what, what we're going to build here today, guys. Uh, the next picture you're going to see is a tote. And we're going to build a very similar system here in just a few minutes, just like this. Uh, we can build this system for under 60 bucks. That depends on a few things. One, it depends on what size tote you're going to buy. It also depends on what the price is at the moment, because you guys know every day prices are going up and up and up on building materials. So uh, we're going to build one very similar to this. I love these systems. They're inexpensive to build, plus a tote's very big. So cubic feet wise, you get a lot more space in these. And even if you don't need the extra space, still doesn't mean that you can't put your worms in a bigger bin. You just might not fill it up all the way as fast. So there's no rule on how big or small the worm bin can be other than it could be too small for your waist. Um, harvest methods, guys, the last thing I wanted to talk about. We've got divide and toss method, we've got back and forth method, and then we've got the commercial bins, and they all are a little bit different. So when we say harvesting worms, we're not necessarily talking about harvesting the worms themselves, we're talking about harvesting those castings, okay? The worms we want to put back in the bin and with new bedding, and we want to put those cocoons back in. Divide and toss is probably the most laborsome, but the most easiest way to get your worms out. And all you do there, guys, is once your bin's filled up and you think, okay, I got worm castings, is you get a tarp, go out in your yard or in the driveway in a shady spot and dump the whole entire bin out. If you got the kids, they love this. And everybody set down the tarp and you just start digging through your compost and you start pulling the worms out and you throw them back in the bin. Okay, and you pick out the cocoons. Now, if you don't get every single cocoon or every single worm, that's okay. Don't drive yourself crazy. Just get the bulk of them out and put them back in the bin. What's left is your worm castings. Now you can put those in the garden or in your pots, okay? And you put the worms back in the bin and you're starting with new food and new bedding and new core and new shredding, uh, shredded paper. It's easy to do. You don't have to really have any special things inside your bin to do this uh, uh, toss or divide and toss method. Just, you're gonna have some labor. It's probably gonna be a four or five hour job, depending on how big your bin is, to go through all your compost and pull those worms out. Back and forth method. That's one of the methods that I kindly use. I go back and forth between these two. 
and uh, I will show you guys when we start building the bin this a little bit better but basically you can take something and divide your bin uh, a, a piece of plexiglass something that's not going to rot I wouldn't use wood because it'll it'll eventually rot plexiglass works great whereas other some type of plastic and cut it to fit the inside of your bin because you know the bins are kindly slanted walled and you can put that in there and you can feed all your food back here and you can keep your worms over here and you can segregate them from the rest of the bin and then as you start to have more food scraps as this size fills up you can actually slide this out and then move it down a few four or five inches and slide it back in and start filling this side up with your food your worms will migrate from over here into that food product after this side is filled up and you're going to your third channel then you can come back in and harvest this first section out with your trowel and all the worms will have left that material and the only thing you're left with is worm castings and they have moved their way over here when you get to the other side of the bin you just start going back the other way and that's why we call that uh, back and forth because you just go back and forth same thing in commercial uh, wormeries where you buy guys are buying worm castings already pre-bagged that's what they do they've just got a big square building block walls and they start piling the food on one side and they just start building piles all the way around and the worms work their way around the whole building and as the worms finish off one wall and are coming down this they go in and harvest all the worm castings over here because all the worms have left they're not going to stay around if there's no food they're going to follow that food so you can train them to leave certain areas of your bin by pushing the food further over and then commercial bins guys actually have trays that stack and that's very similar to how the five gallon bucket system works too you're stacking those buckets inside of each other you're drilling holes and as one bucket fills up with food waste you set the next bucket on top start filling it full of food waste and those worms crawl out of the bottom bucket go through the holes and come up into your next bucket and start eating the food as that bucket's halfway full you can take the bucket below it and now you it's worm free all the worms would have left that bucket and boom and you just keep stacking those buckets with holes in them and those worms just keep going through that cycle. Same thing with commercial bins, there are gonna be trays that have holes in the bottom. As you fill up one tray with food scraps and they break it down into worm castings and that tray's full, you stack the next tray, put the food and they crawl right up out of that tray into your next one. And then you just leapfrog those trays as you empty them out and you start that process over. Any questions on that guys? Connie, do we have any questions online? Um, no, just someone said great information. Thanks for sharing. Okay, good. You guys have any questions on on the system? Okay, what I want to do. I just have one thing. That yes. Maybe, um, I this, I mean, you're saying that that would be maybe sixty dollars, but if you buy a bag of those um, castings, they're like seventeen dollars. Yeah, it's for like, like four four to four to five pounds, absolutely and they're dry those are dry that's dry castings too so you got to think about that it is a ripoff uh, when you buy those those worm castings now if you're a homeowner and you've got a certain potted plant that you want to use worm casting then it might be cheap enough to go down to the feed store and buy that but for somebody who's gardening who wants to throw this out in their garden and if you're cautious too about environmentalism and you're wanting to make sure your food waste and that type of stuff is being recycled worms are the best way to to get that so uh, it's a personal preference, but um, it does work well. Guys, I want to hand these out to you here. Uh, we're going to move in real quick on how to build this, guys, since we don't have any questions on the actual husbandry part of the worms. Yeah. Oh, did you guys already get one? Yeah. Okay, okay. Pass this around to you guys. You got one too? Okay. Everybody got one now? Okay, so what we've got, guys, I think everybody has seen these totes before. These are tough totes. Now when you go and you look for totes in your big box stores or Walmart, don't get the real cheap thin ones that are plastic. Make sure that you get one. And the reason why this thing's tough is you can automatically see that it's got these ridges that have been molded into it. The bottom is those cheap ones. When you guys go buy them, they're smooth all the way around and they don't hold as much weight. And remember, this is going to be heavy. With, with castings in it. So you want something that can stand that weight. So I really recommend you getting these black ones with the yellow lids um, to, to make your, your worm bins out of. Now, the other side of this is, is um, we're actually building this worm bin today for Connie. Connie's gonna get into worms. So I'm gonna do this worm bin for her. But we picked this out for her because this is about the right size. Mine's quite a bit bigger than this one. But you can also buy this tote half this size too. So they sell about four different sizes of these, okay? 
So once again, you guys weighing out your food scraps will dictate how big you want your bin to be, okay? If your husband or wife's into fishing or brother or something like that, maybe you want to go with a bigger one and put more food in there just to have those for fishing. But you guys just want to buy two of these is what you need. You're going to get a lid with both of them. You only need one lid. So I will tell you that second lid, um, I use mine at the house. Uh, I, I've been putting my, my boots on this keep down in the basement, so I just repurposed it. But as we look at the uh, presentation right here on how to make that, the materials needed for bin construction, I put there that you need two tough storage totes. So just make sure that you're getting one that's rigid, guys. You got to get two of them. Um, you also will need one plastic three-quarter inch MPT female bulkhead. What is Chris talking about? This is a bulkhead fitting. Anybody ever seen these before? Bulkhead fittings? Now, I will tell you, this will be your biggest challenge on this worm bin, is finding these bulkheads. And what we will do here in a second is I'm going to drill this out and put this bulkhead fitting in here. And then we're going to put a drain on here so we can drain off the compost tee out of this second bin. And it'll make sense when I, when I put it together. These are hard to find. Home Depot and Lowe's does not carry these. Local hardware stores may or may not carry these. Right now in the Canal Valley Center Hardware in St. Albans is the only place that I've been able to find these in stock. I've been to every hardware store from Marmette to St. Albans and that's the only place that's got them. Menards in Barbersville carries these. But I was there this weekend, they were out of them. So I don't know if it was a fluke or they're going to get them back in. But you can order them offline all day long. Amazon sells them, two day prime and you'll have it. So this right here will be your hardest thing to find. Everything else that I'm going to show you guys, you can go buy pretty much anywhere. But this three quarter inch bulkhead fitting is, is the hard one to look for. So I just want to go ahead and put that out there for you guys. Uh, Scott over here that's behind us here, he actually has uses these on these fish systems that we do too, and he has a hard time finding them. So for whatever reason, they just don't like to sell them around here. You also will need 24 inches of PVC pipe, one inch in diameter, okay? And I've left this a little bit long. I've already cut my pieces and I'll show you what, why we need to do that. Um, don't go buy a 10 foot joint. Lowe's and Home Depot sell this already cut in, in 24 inch piece. So if you don't need any more than, than what you need for this, don't buy a whole long stick of it. You may have some laying around your house. Uh, you also want one plastic three quarter inch Mel valve. In this case, we don't have a plastic valve. We've got a, a brass boiler drain, but this will work just as good too. E e e anything, you just need a, a threaded three quarter inch drain is what you need. Boiler drain's probably your best bet though. And uh, you need a small tube of silicone adhesive, which we have right here. And then you need one square foot of vinyl window screening, which I got a little bit less than that, but that's right here. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then guys, if we flip over here to the next uh, slide, it's gonna talk about the tools that we need for construction. So standard power drill you need. You need a three inch hole saw and a one and a half inch hole saw. Uh, lucky for me, I have a hole saw kit here if you don't have these, I would really ask your family members if they've got them, because these can be a little pricey. These are kind of expensive to buy. And I hate to see you guys have to spend as much money on the bin to buy two hole saws with to cut out the holes to make the bin. So um, definitely ask around about those sizes hole saws. Um, you guys here that work with me here every day, if you're interested in doing this and you don't have this stuff, just let me know and I'll bring it in and, and we'll do it for you here at work. Um, you also need a, a tape measure. An eighth inch drill bit, guys. So anybody's got a drill bit set. Uh, you need two pairs of channel locks or uh, slip joint pliers, if we're gonna be politically correct there. Uh, you need a little bit of sandpaper. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a minute. You also need a tubing cutter to cut your pipe or a chop saw, works very well too. We do not wanna use a hacksaw to cut pipe unless you're one of those people who can cut one very, very straight, but most people, when they cut a pipe with a hacksaw, it's always kind of got a slope to it a little bit. It's not perfectly square. That's why I'm not a fan of the hacksaws. You need a Sharpie pen, which we've got right here, and then a pair of scissors. So a lot of the tools on there, I guarantee it, all of you guys own probably except for the hole saws, usually will probably be the ones that most people don't have. So getting started, guys, uh, for time's sake, I've already done this step, but the first thing you want to do is you want to take one of these bins that you've got, and you want to take that 1 8 inch drill bit and you want to take your drill 
and you want to drill holes in the bottom of your bin. Now, be careful because if you drilled holes here or here, it doesn't really serve any purpose for you because this is the lowest end of the bin. So only drill the holes in the low part of the plastic. But drill you a series of holes and make sure that you pay note to drill holes in the corners, okay? Because the middle of this will kindly bow as it gets wet, uh, weighted. And sometimes wet material will collect in the corner and you want to be able to get that material to drip down into this next coat so that, that material stays dry, doesn't drown those worms, okay? So the first thing to do is to drill a series of eighth inch holes. Now, small worms can go through these holes, but the goal here, the worms usually are not going to go in that hole because there's nothing down there they want. They want to stay up here where the media is at. So this is just to let it drain. On occasion, when you look down in the, in the first bin, you may see some dead worms in your liquid because sometimes some do fall down in there and they can't get back out. Once again, guys, you have nothing to worry about. Uh, you know, you're going to have several thousand worms in there. So after you've drilled these holes in this, you just kind of want to set this tote to the side. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to take that hole saw and we're actually going to drill a hole in the side of this to put the bulkhead fitting in. So for this case, that inch and a half or inch and a three eighths hole saw works great. Now pay attention when you go get your hole saw, you want to make sure that whatever you're drilling is not bigger than what this black gasket is or it's not going to work. So as you guys can see, we're, we're, we're almost perfect with those threads. Uh, you could go up a little bit bigger, which is why I said this right here is inch and three eighths hole saw and inch and a half will, will still give you enough and, and you'll have enough room to, to grip right there. So as you come into your bin, you guys are going to notice that there's always a lip right here. You want to drill the hole right above that lip. So the best thing to do is to come in here with your hole saw, line that up, boom, that's simple. Very thin, easy to pop that hole in. Next thing we're going to do is take that bulkhead fitting with the rubber gasket on the outside of the bin, shove that through, take the other plastic gasket that comes with your, your bulkhead fitting, that goes to the inside, and then lastly we're going to tighten up that nut. And remember, on these bulkhead fittings, they're reverse. So left actually tightens these. So if you start threading it on there and you're like, why won't it go on there? You're probably going the normal way and it just won't work that way. Chris could get it lined up. There we go. guys so once you get this tightened up and you can hand tighten it pretty good but what I like to do is to take those slip joint pliers and just come here on the inside on that nut and just give it another quarter to a half turn just to make sure it's good and tight so you don't get any any le leachate and that's that one's really nice so you got your boiler drain. Now, whether it's plastic or brass, it does not make a difference, okay? Just make sure that it's got three quarter inch MPT uh, threads that go into your bulkhead fitting. But you might wanna put a little bit of, of thread tape on there. Do you need to? No, I, I have it, most people do. It's not like this is under pressure. So uh, it, it's not like you need a lot of thread tape on there, but just for the heck of it, we went ahead and put that on there. But here again, guys, lightly start that in there. And here you do not want to cross thread this. Uh, metal going to plastic threads sometimes will get some leaks and things like that. So just be careful when you're starting. But just turn this, tighten this thing up until it's hand tight. And, and we're perfect right there. And that's all there is. Now you have a drain to drain off any of your liquids and your compost. So you can take a five gallon bucket, put it underneath there, drain off any tea that you may get and take that out in your garden and you can just pour that around the base of your plants and you actually have a homemade compost tea. Now, the next thing you'll need to do is take your pipe and a tape measure and you want to take that 24 inch piece of pipe and you want to score that off into three inch sections. So every three inches you're just going to put a mark with your Sharpie on that piece of pipe. Take your tubing cutter, line it up with the mark, and you should end up with between eight to 10 three inch pieces that are this long right here. Now these are very important. And when I was designing this system, the old systems that we had that were similar to this, we would use bricks in the bottom for our spacers. But the bricks get nasty. They're porous, 
and algae and stuff will grow in there sometimes and just that compost tea soaks into them and I thought plastic's the better way to go because you can clean this stuff you can wash it so I was sitting here trying to think about what could I use and that's when it dawned on me sorry guys are dropping stuff that one inch PVC pipe is a great spacer and all these act is is a spacer for that other tote to set up high so we've got some head space so I take these eight to ten pipes and just lay them in the bottom of this bin and uh, you know you just want to put them in here where you're going to get enough bottom support because remember your bin's going to be kindly heavy with those worms so that's what it looks like there's there's really no rhyme or reason of, of how to set that up the next thing you want to do is take your second bin that's got the holes already pre-drilled slide that guy down in top and 90 percent of the worm bin is ready except for the worms the last thing we need to do is drill a couple of vent holes in the top and use the window screen and I'll explain to you why we want to do that side of it so we'll set that down lay this box up here now these vent holes on top can either be two and a half or or three inches and uh, matter of fact I've still got a piece of plastic in this hole saw from the last worm bin that I made so see there's the yellow disc this one right here that I'm using, guys, is a two and a half hole saw. I wouldn't go any smaller than this. Two and a half, three is great. But here again, you kindly just want to look at your, your lid. And I'll put one probably right there in that diamond. So we got one hole drilled right there. And we'll come up here and drill this next one. Sorry, Connie, I think some of that blew back on you, did it? Yes, I need that window screen. <laughs> Next thing I like to do is just kind of take a box knife or a pair of scissors and just kind of get these burrs knocked down. It doesn't have to be great. This is where the sandpaper, the reason why I have the sandpaper in there. Um, okay, so now we've got the vent holes on top. But if we don't put some type of screen on here, worm could crawl out, but we're not worried about the worms crawling out. I'm more worried about fungus gnats and other insects getting into your worm bin. So we want to exclude that. So window screen works really, really good for that. So what we'll do here, of course the wind is not cooperating, but we'll take this hill, adhesive silicone that we bought in this tube And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a nice fat bead of this right around the top of that hole. Just like that. And you want to make sure it's a continuous bead, guys. You don't want to have any, any spots where it's got a break in the silicone bead. We're going to take this window screen right here and I'm going to cut it in half. And I'm literally just going to take that window screen and you can use a glove if you feel better. I don't really mind to get silicone on my fingers, but you just want to press that screen right into that silicone like that right there. I'm going to do the same thing to this one. And when you go to Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever you're going to buy this stuff, window screen a lot of the times is sold by the foot. It might be three feet wide, but you buy it by the foot. Since you don't need a whole bunch, don't buy a whole roll of window screen. Uh, just get a little section of it or if you've got some old windows at your house or old screens that you might have stored in your basement or building repurpose those window screens we're going to let that dry for about three hours and literally guys that's going to snap right on top and that's your worm bin you're done i mean it's that simple that easy so when you guys get your worms and you order them in and they show up at your house first thing you're going to do is what i like to do is get my core the day before but of course if you order it with your worms it's okay but get that core soak it in a five gallon bucket it'll take like 10 minutes for it to absorb mix in the shredded paper and what i do is i like to dump that in one end of the bin just in a big heap right here and when my worms come in i just dump them right on top i open up the bag i inspect my worms make sure they're alive and everything's okay and i dump them in there i put the lid back on and i don't go back in that worm bin for 48 hours I don't touch those worms or anything. When they come out of that bag, they're gonna be a big ball of them. And, and over that 48 hours, they will slowly dissipate down inside that. They've already been fed before they came to your house. So on day two, day three, 
you're going to go down you're going to introduce some food to them what i usually like to do is i like to start with oats i like to put a couple of handfuls of oats in my bin for the first four, 24 hours when i start to feed and then going into day four i'll start adding vegetable scraps in there now you want to go a little slow at the beginning and ramp up so probably by about week two you can really start loading your bin and give those worms enough time to uh, do their thing but remember you've got to order enough worms for the poundage of food you're putting in if you've got a little if you only order a small quantity of worms and you're putting a lot of food you may get that rotten stink because the worms aren't eating it fast enough and you're going to have to wait for those worms to mate and that population to grow and build so that's the other thing but a worm bin this size if this worm bin was was three quarters of the way full with with food waste we would probably roughly have about 12 to 15,000 worms in this bin so chris that bin starting out how many worms would i put in well, that's where we go back with the math. You'd have to weigh out your food every week and see how much poundage of food that your family wastes, that the worms can eat. It's really not. I recommend that you always go bigger than smaller on the bin because you can go too small and you've got more food waste and you've got bin capacity. A bigger bin, you can just add more in. And the more bin space and the more food you add, the worms are just going to mate and grow their population. And that's what I want to tell everybody is the populations of your worms are going to fluctuate. Because let's say in the summertime you're eating a lot of salads and you're throwing a lot of stuff and in the wintertime your family's not eating that much stuff, your, some of your worms will die. The population will die to meet whatever the demand of the food load that you're putting in. So one other thing we can do before I end and ask for questions is, is if you have a lot of food scraps at certain times of the year, guys, you can put food scraps in Ziploc bags and freeze it and just freeze your food scraps. It doesn't worry if it gets freezer burnt. You can throw it in the back of the freezer and then what you do is take that bag out, let it fall out for a couple hours, go down, dump it in your worm bin. I don't care if that food scrap's been in there for a year, those worms will still eat it. So you can freeze your food scraps to have long-term food for your, your worms. And I know people that do that, vacation, and also people who are change their diet because they're not eating as much fresh vegetables in the dead of winter as they would in the spring or summer. Any questions from you guys on that? Okay, Connie, do we have any questions on the um, Facebook there? Just a lot of uh, positive feedback. Just thanks for sharing it. Great. But, um, and guys, it, it, you guys out here with me and the ones online, if anybody has questions later on, reach out to us, Patriot Gardens. You can either send it to us on our Facebook. The guys that work with me up here, you know where our office is, room 212 here in the annex. Come by, talk to us, and uh, we'll help you out the best we can, okay? Thanks, Chris. Thank you.